wonder, is James? Oh, no, what happened? Is James out the door or is James in? Oh, he's in here. Okay, good. Okay. Okay. So um, we are, we're, we're going to start. Hello, everyone. Shavua Tov. Good week. Um, I'm sorry? It's, is it working? Okay. Okay. Well, it, it's really not so much for us as much as it is for the people who may be watching us at home. Um, it's really wonderful for you to come and for you to be here. I want to recognize that today is Sunday, the 24th of April, and that the 24th of April is the start of the Armenian Genocide. Uh, and I just want to recognize that for a moment and for us to recognize that um, this Armenian Genocide had been coming for decades uh, but really starts to take place in the context of the prolonged conflict and what becomes the armed conflict, the war between Russia and Turkey. In the context of which the Ottomans, the Ottoman Empire, believes that the Armenians who are Christian are somehow more loyal to the Russians than they are to the Ottoman Empire and what had been an effort that's been, that had been taking place for decades on the part of some in the Ottoman Empire to marginalize them uh, eventually becomes a full-fledged effort that becomes a genocide. Uh, and it's on the 24th of April in 1915 that this genocide starts with the arrest of intellectuals and leaders and what eventually becomes uh, the exclusion of Armenians. And uh, I just want to recognize this for a moment. We know that somewhere between 1.2 and 1.5 million Armenians end up dying in this genocide, men, women, and children. We know that this genocide, for the very first time, entails not only the separation of the population, a very deliberate effort to disarm that population, to separate that population from the police, from the armed forces, from the government in ways that become familiar with you know, the story that we tell of the Holocaust, but also that with all that separation, with everything else that's going on, we also know that part of what happens ends up being the transportation of these people, their movement from Turkey, where they, what is today Turkey, where they had lived, Asia Minor, and especially the western parts of Asia Minor, though they're all over the place, the real effort is to transport them by trains to Syria where they're going to be killed. And how that happens, I don't want to go into, and who participates, and the role of the Kurds and other groups. I don't want to go into all of that, but I do want to say the start of it, these arrests start to be made en masse on April 24th, 1915. So we are April 24th, and it's important for us to recognize this. And I am proud of the fact that the United States, the United States Senate, has recognized the Armenian Genocide only a couple of years ago, and that today uh, more and more people are talking about this uh, following what has been a, a significant effort to make this happen. So welcome to you. Thank you for being here. And, and welcome to those of you who are watching us from wherever you may be. Uh, it's wonderful to know that you're here. Um, we're going to do this the way we often do this. We're going to do this the way we, we have been doing this. And today, we're going to start wrapping up the story of Esther. We've spoken about the story of Esther. We're going to start wrapping this up. And I have my phone here next to me. And so I just want to remind everyone, if you want to join our mailing list, and know more about us, and I want to say something about this in a moment. just want to make an announcement. Next week, we're going to meet here. Next week, beginning of May, we're going to meet here. The week of the following week, in other words, in two weeks' time, the 8th of May, we will not be meeting here, and we will not be streaming. 
For those of you who are home, we will not be streaming that day because we will be meeting at a church wherein we will go through a, an interfaith study session uh, with one of my colleagues, more about this by email and through the E-Times, but I want to alert you that on the 8th, we have a special program that's lined up for us. Uh, so for more information, please reach out to Joanna Cullinan at jcullinan at ettti.org. And o as always, please email to me if you have comments or questions and you're home and you're watching from elsewhere during the session and I can respond to these as, as we conclude the session. And as I look at my email, I will be able to respond to these. Today, what we're going to do is start to wrap up our, our learning about Esther. And I am very eager to do that and to really go take us through a little bit of a review of Esther. And today, something of a more extensive review and then start where we left off last time and move forward. We left off last time before the Seder of Passover and then move forward. Let, let's talk about this for a moment. Let's start to wrap up our learning about Esther. First of all, Esther is a unique text among our five scrolls. It's the last scroll that we study in this series of now uh, 15 or so sessions. And it is absolutely unique. First of all, it's unique because it is written in two variants, one Greek and one Hebrew, that seem to be composed about at the same time. It's not clear to us which is the earlier one, the Hebrew or the Greek. We believe that the Hebrew may be a little bit earlier, but they're probably composed at around the same time. In this respect, because they're composed in both Hebrew and in Greek, and because of the way the text is redacted, that it reads like almost a Greek drama. Uh, it, and because of the Hebrew, the Hebrew being so modern, very close to rabbinic Hebrew, very close to what becomes rabbinic Hebrew, we think of this text as a kind of stepping stone between the ancient Hebrew texts that we have in the Hebrew Bible and the classical rabbinical texts that we have. This is kind of an in-between, and it makes its way into the biblical canon. If we ever have to look for a text that is a little bit more classical within our biblical canon, it's the text of the Scroll of Esther. It's a remarkable text in this regard because it's an in-between text. Think about the book of Daniel, which is a relatively late book of the Hebrew Bible. Think about other books of the Hebrew Bible that are relatively late. They're composed in Hebrew and Aramaic. They're composed in a very different kind of style. The Scroll of Esther has a profound Greek classical influence to it. Uh, it is obviously somehow either composed or passes through Alexandria in Egypt, which is a hotbed of Greek and both he Greek and Hebrew cultures. And it makes its way into our biblical canon and then becomes controversial within the biblical canon. In other words, in the spectrum that moves us towards classical texts, the scroll of Esther is right there, and it's part of our Hebrew Bible, which is remarkable. It's remarkable that it's made it into the canon, and it's remarkable that it is there in this style and in this kind of language, in a way that many other texts are not. Many of the other wisdom texts that we find from that period end up being external books to the Hebrew Bible and are not included in our Hebrew Bible. They are sometimes included in the Christian canon, but that's a different story. So first of all, it's kind of a classical text, very different text, very different style, very different language, an in-between kind of text that finds its way into the Hebrew Bible. Third century before the Common Era. Quite remarkable. Then, as we looked into the Esther scroll, we have been discovering over these past three sessions that it is a political document. Now, I want to speak about this at some greater length today and to really 
think about what this means. What do we mean when we say a political text? Uh, every text is in one way or another political, right? Uh, what do we mean by a political? What's a non-political text? What's an apolitical text? What is a political text? What are we talking about here in terms of political as opposed to religious, as opposed to love, as opposed to what? What are we saying here? What is a political text? And I want to clarify this for a moment, and I also want to sharpen the point for a moment. What is this political text? The political text and the political elements of the scroll of Esther that we speak about are very distinct from other texts that we read in the Hebrew Bible. Prophetic texts are not apolitical. It isn't that they're apolitical. But in the context of prophetic literature, what do we read about? We read about the promise of redemption in the future. The valley of the dry bones and the return to life of the Jewish nation. Your house, says Isaiah, will be a house of worship for all nations. For when a time with the temple will be rebuilt, the temple will become a gathering place and a worship place for all nations. The priests shall be taken from all nations, right? In, in a number of the in two other prophets, uh, among the minor prophets. We hear a statement that relates to some kind of religious rebirth, of national rebirth, some kind of covenant, the notion that we read of in the Shema Israel in Deuteronomy, right? Notion of everlasting covenant between the people of Israel and their God. Should you do, should you perform my commandments, vehaya im shamoa tishmeu el mitzvotai, should you perform my commandments, the rain will occur in its time, there will be harvest, everything will come in its time, everything will be okay. In other words, a sense that we're not only dealing with politics, we're dealing with something else as well. A notion of covenant, a notion of redemption, a world that will be a better world for us and for our children. Something bigger and better than we have had thus far. In Esther? No. None of that. The text of Esther is about power. Power struggle. It is about power. It is about political machinations. It is about how one undoes a negative ill influence, a hateful influence. How one emerges. How one deals with lobbying. How one deals with government. How one deals with these particular issues. Is this about any kind of redemption? Is this about the world to come? Is this about the rebuilding of the temple? Is this about our religious mission in the world? Is this about taking care of the widow and the orphan? No. It's a text that deals with politics with a low P. A standard, regular P, as opposed to a capital P. It's a political document wherein politics are stripped of religion. They're stripped of vision. They're stripped of redemption. They're stripped of prophecy as the text comes down to us in the Hebrew Bible. But more than that, politics here is a game of power in the context of which I want to suggest to you there are winners and there are losers. Sometimes you are on top and sometimes you're at the bottom. Sometimes you wield power and at other times you are threatened. This is the nature of the political game. The political game is not just about influence to do good in the world, building the city on the hill, being able to make the world a better place. That's lovely. But politics, and first and foremost, 
here in the text of Esther. First and foremost is about survival. It's about making it. The text of Esther is not just a political text because the prophets are not. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, there's politics there. In Deuteronomy, there's politics there. In Leviticus, there's politics. There's politics everywhere. Esther is a political text in that it is profoundly political and does not include the other elements that we find in other texts in the Hebrew Bible. When we speak about Esther being a political text, that's what we mean. It is a political handbook. It tells us a story from which we learn something about politics and the way politics unfold and the promise of politics and the problems that arise with politics. Right? And all these other elements, the land of Israel, milk and honey, temple, covenant, redemption, return to life, not there. Simply not there. So I want to clarify that before we move forward so that we really understand what it is that we're saying when we're calling it a political text. Then, I want to point out one more thing. While it is a political text, in many ways a political story, a political drama, the story of Esther is profoundly about gender. It's not just politics. It is politics and gender. And it is also not just politics and gender, but gender politics. From the very beginning, the story of Vashti that we looked at is a story of gender and politics. And then Esther, and Esther's relationship with Mordechai, and Esther's relationship with Achashverosh, and Esther's role in the story is all, and Esther vis-a-vis -vis Haman, the competition for the loyalty of the king between Esther and Haman, that triangle, is profoundly not just about politics, but about gender. And about gender and politics at the same time, and this is something that we really want to pay close attention to really important for us to identify this and to understand this. This is what we're looking at. It's a story of politics, wherein politics is one major pillar here. And by politics, I mean strict politics, zero-sum politics, wherein we don't think about the world. We don't think about the well-being of the great empire of Persia, Whose politics is this? Jewish politics. It's what's good for the Jews, the Hebrews, those Judeans who are in Persia. That's the political game here, right? It's we, the Jews, as a minority, as a diaspora community, right? We're going to talk about the story of Esther being a diaspora story, right? But it's politics and gender that are the two central organizing themes and pillars of the Esther story. And we've seen that. And by now, this should be a review. This should now not be new any longer. This should now be familiar. Does that, am I making sense? Are we, are, yes? Is this still, okay, good. Finally, the story of Esther is quintessentially a diaspora story. Now we're a minority. 
Now this is no longer about us fighting a war against another enemy, about conquest of the land, and about other people wishing to conquer our land. It's not about our fighting for our independence. It's no longer about our creating an alliance with Egypt or with Assyria. It's no longer about the temple. It's no longer about Jewish polity as an independent being. Rather, it is about Jewish politics, politics, within a Jewish community, the organizing of a Jewish community, the lobbying for a Jewish community as a minority in another polity. Now, that is fine. Can we conceive of Jews as a minority, those Judeans as a minority within Persia? Yes. But, here we're talking about a Jewish minority that also has the capacity to get armed, to fight for itself. Here we have the story, the notion of a Jewish minority that wants to be part of Persia, that wants to assimilate, that wants to have a seat in government, and that at the same time wants to remain autonomous wants to remain somewhat independent, wants to remain somewhat armed, wants to remain somewhat in power, and wants to retain its identity. So, the scroll of Esther becomes the guidebook for the rabbis in dealing with rabbinic Judaism moving forward. What is the goal of the rabbis? Where are we throughout 2,000 years of diaspora? What is it that we seek to do? To maintain our independence, to maintain our identity, to maintain our communal institutions, to maintain our laws, to be able to tax our own people, to be able to set our own social and educational priorities, to be able to regulate personal status for members of our own community, what I mean is marriage and divorce and the status of children. We want to be able to do all of that while living in other countries, having a seat among the rulers of other countries, being able to influence governments, in the country wherein we live, being autonomous on the one hand and in a position to influence on the other. Herein lies the tension of Jewish life throughout 2,000 years of diaspora. What is the one document that sets, that sets this train in motion, that gets this train out of the station, the scroll of Esther. And where do we find it? Unbelievably, in the Hebrew Bible. The scroll of Esther in this regard is the single most relevant book to our lives for leaders of the Jewish community. So what we're looking at is not just another scroll. This is not about just another story. This is not just about a collection of love poems that used to be read in weddings that offer us a real insight into life in Judea at a particular set of times. This is different. We're dealing with different material here and a different kind of influence. And that's the reason for which, when it comes to the Protestant Reformation, the Protestants seize upon the scroll of Esther as one of their core texts. This is the reason for which the Jewish community turns Purim into one of its major moments. Does this, am I making sense? Yeah? So now I really want to clarify this. I really want to sharpen the message today I hope this makes sense, and if there are questions, you know, we can talk about them. Okay? Good. So now I want to lead us here into where we left off last time. 
And you remember that we looked at this image before. This is the Jan Steen uh, uh, image from the Cleve Cleveland Museum of Art. I'm going to try another image and see whether we can see it of the same painting. Is this better? Okay. Let's talk about this image. This is from the Cleveland Museum of Art. Let's talk about this. I tried to really fidget with it and clean this up. Jan Steen is a 16th, uh, is, is, I'm sorry, a 17th century, a 17th century, 1600s Dutch artist. He's born in Leiden. Um, he is a Catholic throughout his life. And uh, he paints a number of paintings that are very significant. He's actually a pioneer in terms of his style. Uh, he paints with a lot of skepticism, a lot of humor in his paintings of a number of different scenes from classical literature and from the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and uh, his paintings are, are, again, he has a real sensibility for the text, which is one of the reasons I really like him. He dies, I believe, in the 1670s. Um, so, he, I mean, he's, he's one of those. He's then copied by a number of other artists. And we have this in the Cleveland Museum of Art. Take a look at this scene, and I want to speak about this scene for a moment. I don't want to take too much time because we have a lot to cover, but this is really, I promised we would come back to this, and this really is worth talking about. Um, let, me, let me go back to the scene. First of all, you, can you see Esther sitting there? You see Esther sitting at the table, right? And you see Ahasuerus standing up, the king standing up? It's very hard to see. Ahasuerus is the central figure, is the central figure there. And you see Haman prostrated on the chair uh, on the side. Do you see these figures? Yes. Uh, would you like to come closer, perhaps? I'm too close. It's, really it's very difficult to see. I see this. I, I see, I'm so sorry that we, the lighting here, and I, I, we're trying with the shades and everything, but it's, it's very difficult to see. I want you to see something about this painting. I want you to see a number of things about this painting. First of all, it paints, it offers for us the sense of a moment. This is what we call a scene. What is a scene? A scene is something that occurs among people wherein the action, the regular course of events, stops. Right? And people are suddenly taken by something that's happening. What is happening? Ahasuerus, in the middle here, the central figure, if you can see it, is standing up and raising his hand and speaking, speaking out, right? And look at this. On one side, on the side of Haman, the person in the silver gray is holding a jug of wine, right? The goblet of wine that Haman was using is on the floor, right? Haman is basically lying prostrate on the chair, yes, with his head leaning to the side and basically covering himself because he's been defeated, right? But how is Haman dressed? First of all, he looks inebriated. He has the person there with a jug of wine right behind him. Look at his clothing. You can't tell the clothing here in the way that the picture is, is projected. It's golden. His clothing is golden. Look at what is on his chair. Right on his chair. Do you see what's going on there behind this on his chair? There's a royal robe, a crimson royal robe. He comes to this place wearing golden clothes, and a, a crimson robe. And he is wearing this turban, which is only matched by the king's turban. In other words, Haman comes into this like royalty. And look at the way he is lying prostrate and defeated with his goblet on the floor. Ahasuerus is standing there looking inebriated himself, right? standing there not quite solid on his feet, right? And by the way, a little bit overweight. Ahasuerus uh, needs a diet, right? Uh, standing there holding his arm up, 
And look at what is happening here behind Esther, who is fully composed, completely composed, is there at the table speaking eloquently, right? And by the way, dressed in, shall we say, a way that uh, highlights her feminine features. Is that appropriate to say? I mean, right? Look at every other woman, the way other women are dressed there. No one is dressed like Esther. And where is the light showing, right? What is the light projected from? From her chest, right? I mean, this is the way it's projected here in the painting, which speaks to particular female gender roles and perceptions, right? It speaks to a particular, right, a trope that we see in our culture, right, and in the culture that's being presented here, right? But she is fully composed, the one place that's fully composed. The king is standing up, raising his hand. Look at the person serving the wine, be the wine behind Haman. They're looking at the king. Everybody is looking at the servant who is behind Esther, who also has a jug of wine in her hand, is looking at the king. The other servant who's behind her, who's dressed in a kind of mustard color, who's holding a pot of food, is looking at the king. Everybody's looking at the king. The person with the jug here uh, behind Esther, who's in the blue, blue silver, Behind Esther, you can barely see it. She's looking at Achashverosh going, really? Is this really happening? Right? I mean, you see what is happening. You see the scene here. What is this? It's a political scene. This is the leadership of the country. This is the leadership of Persia. This is taking place in public with other people around, with food and with alcohol, with waiters and waitresses, with people in the crowd, men and women. You can't see this because the painting here, the, re the, the way the painting is projected is not good enough. There is a black-skinned person in the back here, right, to demonstrate how large Persia is, how many different courtiers are there from different nationalities, different places inside Persia. This is a political scene. By the way, when is this taking place? According to the text of the scroll of Esther, when did these uh, uh, feasts take place? At night, right? In the evenings. According to this painting, where is this taking place? Look, look at the sky. It's during the day. They're drunk during the day. They have been drinking their heads off during the day. And everybody is around. The courtiers are around. Everybody is around. And Esther is defeating Haman with her composure, with her argument. In the middle of the day, with Haman drunk, his goblet on the floor, and Achashverosh barely on his feet, getting angry. This is the scene. When we talk about Esther being a political document, he got it. This is what he's depicting. This is the depiction of a political scene, right? One day, I hope we're going to be able to make it to the Cleveland Museum of Art and look at some of the art that is relevant to our to our scrolls and to our scriptures. There's quite a bit in the Cleveland Museum of Art. I happen to love this stuff. And this painting is a painting that I, I think is just extraordinary. There is, a, there is a quality to that painting. And I look forward to one day seeing it with you in person in the Cleveland Museum of Art and really talking about this in detail. We don't have the time right now, but I wanted to return to it because we couldn't really speak of it in detail last time around. Jan Steen, middle of the 17th century Dutch, which happens to be in the Cleveland Museum of Art. Okay, all right. I think I've made my point, right? Um, we understand gender and politics and the power play and the food and the drink and the emotion and all of these things that we've already spoken about. So, 
what does this tell us? What does this teach us about the scroll of Esther and what it tells us about the world? About the world that we live in, the world that we inhabit. What does it tell us about the world? We have to talk about this. We absolutely have to talk about this. It's our last full session about the scroll of Esther. And I want to share this with you today. Some of it is difficult because it relates to our lives. But it's important for us to talk about. It's important for us to think about it. And we've started to address it. I want to share with you that one of the really important words that need to be understood in order for us to understand the Esther story is the word hafach in Hebrew. The H-P-C-H, hafach, hapach, hafach, right? That root in Hebrew, which means to diametrically overturn to revolutionize, to change from one to the other in no time. This notion of overturning, this notion of uncertainty, this notion of the possibility of things shifting dramatically is key to our understanding of the book of Esther, the scroll of Esther. And it is key to our understanding the world as it is understood in the scroll of Esther. And I want to talk about change and change in the world today as it relates to the scroll of Esther. Right? So, and I want to talk about it in the context not just of change, but of dramatic, big, significant change as it occurs in relation to the scroll of Esther. So let's take a look at change in that kind of way in the Hebrew Bible. And I'm only going to offer a few examples so that we really have the time to talk about the scroll of Esther. Uh, take a look at Leviticus. This is one of those things we never study because we are disgusted by it. We just read this Torah portion uh, within the last two weeks, a couple of weeks. We don't want to read this stuff. It's about leprosy. It's about skin diseases, right? We don't want to know, right? But let's take a look at it for one moment and see what this really means. What is the priest in the context of leprosy? The priest is the first responder. The priest is the medical professional who comes and evaluates leprosy. And what is the priest's major three roles to identify the medical condition, to identify the ritual condition, in other words, the religious status of the person based on the medical diagnosis, and therefore to identify what needs to be done with the person. Should the person be secluded, sent away from the encampment, can the person stay? These are the three roles of the priest, right? The priest's world, the world of the Kohen, of the priest, is divided into two primary sets of conditions wherein we Jews, Judeans, Hebrews, find ourselves. We are either pure or we are impure. That's it. There are two sets of categories into which we fit. We are pure or we are impure. And the priest's job is to decide where do we fit. Are we pure or are we impure? And so much of the priest's work is an implication of this decision that needs to be made. Yes? This is why the priest is the first responder in the case of leprosy. So what happens here in the case of the leper? If a person has a scaly affection, it shall be reported to the priest. The priest then comes to observe 
And if the priest finds that the skin has a white swelling, in other words, you know how when you have a wound on your skin, that sometimes a white crust forms on the skin to cover the wound? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes? That as the skin repairs itself, there's a scaly crust that builds, a yellowy crust that builds, right? And that when the skin repairs, it's actually a little bit whiter than the rest of the skin because it has had less exposure. Do you know what I'm talking about? That's what the priest is looking for. If that covering has turned white and has some white hair around it, yellowy white hair around it, which often happens, we know it too often happens, what is the implication? The implication is that this is a sign of an old wound, of an old what might have been leprosy, if it's multiple wounds on the limbs, right? It's a sign of an old leprosy that the body is getting over, right? It's not leprosy in the way we understand it today. Leprosy is code for a skin disease that creates these kinds of wounds, right? And in that case, it's old. It's not active. It's not infectious right now. Yes? And if that's what the priest says, the priest pronounces the person impure. However, being impure, because they're not fully healed, being impure, the person doesn't need to be isolated. Right? Yes? Do you understand? We see what's going on here. The priest is the person offering the diagnosis and the implications of the diagnosis. If there's a decision tree that's being designed here, if it's like this, then it's like this. Yes? Right? It's, it's really quite simple. Yes, Marie? Why isn't there a judgment on the world impurity? Why does it have to just be physical impurity? Well, here we're talking about physical impurity. There is no moral implication. The question is, is there a moral component to this? I'm rephrasing your question. Forgive me, Marie. Is there a moral implication to this? Here, absolutely not. There is no moral implication. It's plainly physical. It's all about the physical right? You can be pure, you can be impure, you're as good a person, you know, as you were yesterday. You're impure, but it, it's not about your soul. It's about your, your physical well-being. Yes? Okay, that's the situation. Now, if the eruption spreads out over the skin so that it covers all the skin of the affected person from head to toe, uh, the priest shall pronounce the person as pure. In other words, if everything is white, Yes? If everything is scaly and white, and if we do not see an open wound, an open skin, and bleeding, if we do not see the red of the flesh, right? We're okay. The person is pure, right? Because the leprosy has transformed itself from being red, from being an open wound, to being all white. The word turned in Hebrew is that hafach. In other words, we have turned from one status of impurity to purity because the wound has turned into white flesh. It's either black, it's either brown, red, or white. It's either impure or pure. Yes? Do you understand? This is the transformation. We're moving from one legal category to another, from one medical category to another. Do you see what's happening here? Yes? What the priest is doing? Here is, right? But if the colored flesh again turns white, it transforms itself, right? After, you know, the colored flesh has appeared, and then the person can become pure again. The moment that there is a wound, an open wound, that there's blood, that we see the red, that we see that happening, the person is impure. If the flesh has cleared and the skin has covered the flesh and the body has recovered, the person is pure. Am I making sense? Yes? Do you see what's happening here in the book of Leviticus? We have transformed from one category to another, changed from impure to pure, from pure to impure. Yeah? Which for the priest and for us is a huge, it's huge. You have to quarantine, you don't have to quarantine. It makes a big difference, right? This is how it occurs in our lives, yes? 
Leviticus, and I wanted to mention that because we so often just skip over this and don't quite understand why this is here and what the implications of this are. But this is just the beginning. Let's take a look at a little bit more. Let's take a look at this and see what we have here. This is a remarkable story. Joshua chapter 8. Joshua has now started conquering the land of Canaan, starting with Jericho and moved forward in the land of Canaan, and now Joshua is at the gate of the city called Ai. Ai with an Ain. This is the way the city is called. And God, and they're afraid of the Ai. They're afraid of the city. The Hebrews think we're never going to be able to take this city. What are we going to do with this city? How are we going to attack it? How are we going to conquer it? How is this going to work? Right? And God says to Joshua and to the Hebrew fighters, go and conquer the city of Ai. And I'm going to make this a long story short, but Joshua sends his troops, establishes the major encampment to the north of the city, but then sets up an ambush west of the city in a valley wherein the troops are hidden. It's in a valley. It's in a depression. So the people of the eye can't see them because they're, they're, they're inside the wadi, they're inside that emek, they're inside that valley. Uh, and so he places most of his troops north of the city and prepares to attack the city. He then attacks the city. The eye, the king of the eye, sees the troops, and the king sees them, and all his people, the fighters, rush out early to attack the invaders. And all of them, all of the fighters, focus on uh, the, the army that is right there north of the city. Joshua chapter 8, I don't know what page we're on, but if you want to open the books, that's fine. Otherwise, it's here on the screen. And Joshua and the troops flee into the desert. They run away from the king of the eye and from his fighters. They flee and run away. At some point, God says to Joshua, lift your arm and your weapon and give a sign to those people who are now laying in ambush. Your 5,000 fighters who are part of that ambush, hold out the javelin in your hand toward I, for I will deliver it into your hands. He does, and look at what happens here. Look at what happens immediately. The ambush comes rushing out into the eye. The fighters are pursuing the Israelites who are fleeing into the desert, right? The eye, the city has been emptied of fighters. These 5,000 troops run into the city, they capture it, and they put it on fire. They set fire to it. Now the fighters from the eye are looking back, seeing that their city is burning. Now they are enclosed between the Israelite fighters who have fled before them and the Israelite fighters who are in the eye. There's 5,000 of them. They're in between, and this is how they're defeated. What does the Hebrew Bible tell us? Take a look at this verse, right? And we're in verse 20. The people who had been fleeing to the wilderness now turned into, transformed into, again that word, the pursuers. One moment you were fleeing for your life, now you're pursuing the enemy. This is that kind of diametrically opposed transformation we're talking about, right? Right? It's not just about the skin and purity and impurity. It is about you. A moment ago, you were defeated. Now you're on the attack. Do you? Yes? Does that? Am I? Yeah? Does that make sense? You understand the scene. You understand what happened here, right? This transformation. And who led the transformation? God, right? Who can do the, Who can engage in that change? God. Who causes us to have leprosy? Who's, in, who's created those germs and those viruses? Right? Right? I hope it wasn't a lab somewhere in China. But I, uh, who knows, right? But, but, right? but who, where does this come from, right? Where does all of this come from? Yes? Yeah, do you see what I'm saying? 
in the biblical understanding of the world, this comes from God. Yeah, God is the source of this transformation. Yes? Okay, we're going to move forward. I want to make sure that we have time to... Oh, my goodness. Um, we're running short of time. Jonah, the book of Jonah. I'm just offering a few examples. Look at the book of Jonah. The city of Nineveh is the largest city in the world. It's the New York City, Shanghai, I don't know what, uh, uh, of the world. It's the largest city in the world. Jonah comes in and says, in 40 days it will be overturned. It will be, over, it will be undone. The entire city, the capital of Assyria, the largest city, hanging gardens. I mean, the largest library in the ancient world. Right? In 40 days, it will be undone. The whole city will be undone. This is the word. It shall be overthrown. It's that world. It's that word. Nehepechet, it says. Nehepechet in the book of Jonah. Right? That's the word that he uses. It's again that same root. That's the kind of transformation, right? Who's going to overthrow the city of Nineveh? God is going to overthrow the city of Nineveh. Why? Because the people have sinned, right? One day you have an amazing city. One day it's, it's New York City. One day you're... The following day the city will be undone. The city will be overturned, right? Right? One day there was this amazing city in New Orleans, the following, you know, within a week after Katrina. This is what we're looking at, right? But with the largest city in the world, the seat of the largest empire in the world at the time. This is the kind of transformation that we are looking at, right? Yes? Do we, do we, are we getting a sense of this? Okay. And now we come to the scroll of lamentations, which is going to lead us into the next, into the next session, and hopefully our, our moving discussions. Remember chapter five of the scroll of lamentations. Remember the defeat of Judah. Remember the destruction of the temple. Remember the exile. Remember the killing of all those people who were involved in government. Remember that all of those people were pursued and killed and exiled. Remember the exile of all the artisans, all the smiths, so that no one would be able to make weapons in Judah anymore? Remember all of that? Remember the suffering of the people? Remember the Scroll of Lamentations, everything we talked about in the Scroll of Lamentations? Do you remember that? No? You don't remember Echa? We studied Echa. This was, you know, a, a little bit earlier on. Yes, you remember we talked about all of that? Chapter 5 of the Scroll of Lamentations. Look at what they're saying. We are pursued. We are tired. We have given no rest. We're refugees. There's no place for us to rest. We hold our hand to Egypt, to Assyria for bread. We hold out our hands to strangers asking for bread. This is our situation. Our parents sinned, and we now bear their guilt. Right? What's happened here? Why is this happening to us? We are being punished for the sins of past generations here in the book of Lamentations. Slaves rule over us with none to rescue us from them. They have ravished women in Zion, maidens in the towns of Judah. Princes have been hanged. No respect has been shown to the elders. Do you remember reading some of this? Is this familiar, right? Do you, do you see all of this, right? Yes? Um, and then, where do we move from here? Like verses 13 to 15, do you remember what we're looking at here? Take a look at this. Young men carry millstones and so on and so forth. Gone is the joy of our hearts. Our dancing is transformed into mourning. This is the verb. That's the transformation. Dancing, celebration, well-being happiness into mourning. This is the kind of transformation we're talking about. 
Pursuer pursued, healthy, sick, happiness, mourning. It's diametrically opposed. Diametrically opposed. This is the kind of transformation we're talking about here in the context of this verb. Am I making sense? Yeah? Yeah, does that help here for us to understand some of our biblical outlook, right? And who alone can bring about such a transformation? God, right? How else can we explain this kind of transformation? What do you mean one day I'm healthy, one day I'm sick? What do you mean one day I'm independent, the other day I'm enslaved? What do you mean I'm running away and the, mo the second moment I, I'm, 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 I'm conquering a city? It, how does one make sense of this? How does one even process these kinds of changes? The only answer can be God, right? Until we arrive at the scroll of Esther. Because the scroll of Esther is a political document. It's a political drama. It's the way we live in the world and it tells us something about the world. So now, chapter 9 of the Scroll of Esther. What page is chapter 9 of the Scroll of Esther? What is, what is the Scroll of Esther, chapter 9? 1466. 1466. It's on the screen as well. And so, at the conclusion of the story, we know the story of Esther. We've talked about it. Now we know it. At the conclusion of the story of Esther, where are we here? Right? What happened in brief? How do we summarize this and conclude the story? Because chapters 9 and 10 are the conclusion of the story. Right? Thirteenth day of the twelfth month, when the king's command and decree were executed that very day on which the enemies of the Jews had expected to exercise their power over the Jews. Our enemies had expected to now exercise their power over us. On that day, the opposite happened. Everything transformed itself. Right? That's the story of Purim. A moment ago, we were going to be exterminated, annihilated, killed by Haman, and all of our property was going to be seized. A moment ago, on that day, the complete opposite happened. The Jews had their enemies in their power. Suddenly, we turned from being the pursued, and not only the pursued, but under threat of complete annihilation. And what happened? The exact opposite. The Jews ended up killing 70,000 people in Persia. All their enemies. Haman and his children are hanged. Right? Remember the story? Yes? The exact opposite has happened. Yes? You see that? It's this transformation into a world that is the mirror image of what we expected to see happen. Yes? That was what happened. And that is the transformation we're talking about. And Mordechai recorded all of this. And Mordechai records all of this and sends dispatches to all the Jews throughout the provinces, right? And says that here, these are going to be days of celebration. The same month, on the same month, at the same time, on the same days, which have been transformed from grief and mourning to festivity and joy. The time has been revolutionized. It's been completely altered. From a time of defeat and of mourning and of thinking we were going to be complete, we're done for, we're finished, to a time of victory, of power over our enemies and of festivity and of joy. Yes? 
Who is the only, who could make that happen? Please, go ahead. I'm just thinking that you spoke about Ukraine earlier, and in, we're not at the end yet. We don't know. But, but Ukraine has triumphed in a way over Russia. Russia expected to have all that power. It's really fascinating. What, what, yeah, so I'm going to repeat the question. I'm going to repeat your comment. The question is, look at what's happening in the Ukraine. The Russians expected to march into the Ukraine, take over the Ukraine relatively easily, without much fighting, without much loss of life, be greeted as liberators, be greeted as the power, right? Uh, and certainly did not, we understand, or we think, we're told, we're not expecting to meet this kind of opposition to meet this kind of resistance and look at what is happening, now it's a very different dynamic. And who knows, maybe with Western weapons, maybe with, with other assistance, who knows how this will end, right? In other words, the situation has been transformed, right? Uh, at the same time, Ukraine is being decimated. I mean, and, and, and we have a crisis on our hands of 12 plus million people, more than 12 million people, who are now displaced. Think about this for a moment. Out of a country of 44 million people, approximately, right? There are 12 million, more than 12 million people are displaced. 12 million within the country, 7 million within the country, and 5 million refugees who have left the country, more than 5 million now. I mean, Poland is now saying they're at capacity. They cannot take any more refugees. Other places are, I mean, the, the, we're looking at a re over 50 days, 50, 60 days. It's been only oh, just about two months. Look at what's happened. Look at what's happened here, right? Uh, so, so, I mean, but thank you. Thank you for that comment and that question. But this is, and here we know who can create that transformation. Who can make this transformation happen? Only God. The, uh, this notion of hafach, hafecha, transforming, changing, and this is not the way it's used in modern Hebrew. The word in modern Hebrew means to alter, to change, to undo, right? But in biblical Hebrew, it is much stronger. It's a much stronger word, and the entire concept is a much stronger concept, right? And it tells us something about the world. The world is uncertain, but in a way that could be very dramatic, and, and completely upsetting, completely upsetting the order. The world is unpredictable. And what is the force that acts in the world that renders it unpredictable in these kinds of ways? It's God, right? Yes, we, we, uh, we, we see this, we understand it. And so why did this happen? How could this have happened, right, in the scroll of Esther? For Haman, son of Hamdata. Why? Because Haman, the son of Hamdata, the Agagite, in other words, the Amalekite, the hater of the Judeans, of the Hebrews, the foe of all the Jews, had plotted to destroy the Jews and had cast the poor, the lot, with the intent to crush and exterminate the Jews. But then Esther came before the king, and he commanded with the promulgation of this decree, let the evil plot which Haman devised against the Jews recoil on its own head. So what happened? They impaled him and his sons on that pole that he had erected for Mordechai. In other words, what brought about this transformation? human beings, Haman and Esther. Now let us pause for a moment. We need to talk about this. Now you understand what I mean when I say that Esther is a classical text and that Esther is a political text. This says what does this say to us? What is the message? I'm going to put this as a question instead of answering it. What does this text tell us about our world? About our condition within the world? 
You may be at the top, you may be at the bottom, you don't know what tomorrow will bring. We do not know what this world is going to be like. We, 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 you know, as much as we plan, as much as we think we know, as much as we think we understand, there are things we don't know, there are powers out there that are not visible to us. And not only is the world going to gradually change because it's going to be gradual global warming or because it's going to be gradual this or gradual that, sometimes the transformation will be dramatic from one side to the other. And we will not have seen it coming. It will be oppositional, diametrical change. 1933, Germany is a democracy. April 1933, no democracy, finished. How long did it take? 90 days, from January to April of 1933. Nothing, no time. A democratic culture, multi-party system, elections, opposition papers, government papers, various political parties, culture, a free press, an independent judiciary, gone, finished, in no time. Did anyone see it coming? No. Did anyone see the Bolshevik Revolution coming? No. Did we know this was going to happen? We didn't know this was going to happen. I mean, think about what happened in our world. Think about millions of people being caught in those situations that were, un I mean, unthinkable. And of course, we know from, from the scholarship about this, the Jews of Germany saw this happening in 1933, then the Nuremberg Laws in 1936, then Kristallnacht in 1938, the Anschluss in Vienna. Nothing, no time, from one day to the next. The Jews had been citizens of Austria from the following day. They were no longer citizens. Within three weeks, their status completely changed. But who could imagine? Yes. But I'd like to see, is there a message here? There is a message here. The question is, is there a message here? There is a message here. First of all, the Hebrew Bible says, yes, our world can transform. I mean, and diametrically. You're living in a perfect world one day, there's a pandemic the next. Your world is shut down. It can happen. But second, what does the scroll of Esther tell us? It may be from God, but you n do not relinquish responsibility. You better get off your seats and do something. You better act. Throughout the whole of the Hebrew Bible, look at this. By the way, where is this verb also used, the transformation used, right? Take a look at this, the book of Exodus. Uh, chapter 7. Chapter 7. Moses comes before Pharaoh. What happens to the stick that Moses wields, right? Turns into a snake. It trans This piece of wood, a stick, turns itself into a living being, a snake. A complete that's the transformation that's taking place. Who does that? God. Who can transform our world? God. Throughout the Hebrew Bible, who can transform the world? God. Whom do we reach out to when the world is transformed? God. What happens in the scroll of Esther? Who saved the day? We have Esther. We have to navigate you know, it says that every is We have to navigate this. The world is political, and you better be ready to play the game. You better be ready. Now enough of this praying and relying and, and crying to God and fasting. and Very nice. Very nice. It's not enough. 
Now, now, now you understand why the rabbis were not sure about this being in the Hebrew Bible. The message of the scroll of Esther is you are diaspora Jews now. You better pay attention. Open your eyes, open your ears, be ready to act, be ready to function, be ready to overturn the most dramatic, horrific changes you can imagine. Think about the implications and be ready to act. This isn't just about God. What the scroll of Esther here does is to categorically, consciously undo what we have learned throughout the rest of the Hebrew Bible. It tells us something profound about our being as members of a minority. This To say that the book of Esther in this respect is revolutionary or is groundbreaking doesn't start to cover it. It teaches us the world is harsh. The world is difficult. The world is unpredictable. The world is dangerous. And we better be ready. And if we're not ready, we're not going to get to celebrate. But if we are successful, we better recognize how fortunate we were to be successful and celebrate. It's a dark view of the world. It's a realistic, dark view of the world. Now, where is the prophetic vision here? Where is the world being a better place? Where is the Jews living happily ever after? No. No. During the days of Mordechai and Esther, while he was prime minister and she was the queen, everything was fine. The Jews had it fine. What happens afterwards? All bets are off. Remember Joseph in Egypt? Remember what happens after Joseph dies? All bets are off. Right? Did you? Yes. So, so the question is, what do we do? So the question is, what do we do? First of all, I just want you to know that two weeks ago, we held a benefit con concert for Ukrainian refugees. On that day, we raised, one day, more than $20,000 for Ukrainian refugees. This congregation has raised much, much more, many tens of thousands of dollars more through the Federation campaign and other campaigns that we have been promoting and has also sent van loads, van loads of material for refugees. Uh, and we are doing other work, advocacy work, with our elected leaders with regard to Ukrainian refugees. There's more work that's being done, and we are also in touch with the Ukrainian community here in Cleveland and coordinating our efforts with them. Don't think that we are sitting here and not acting. This congregation is acting. This congregation is doing. And we are doing. And sometimes not everything we do is visible. But we are doing. Right? But
So, so the question again is, we may be making a difference to some refugees, we may be assisting with a whole number of others, and the entire reform movement is, 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 is drafted into this effort, has, has been implicated in this effort, but what are we doing in the Ukraine itself? What are we doing here with regard to Russian aggression? We have to understand that we are not in a position, we are not in a, we have to understand the world as it is. Your rabbi cannot stop the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. In fact, the President of the United States of America cannot stop, it appears, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. The leadership of NATO cannot stop the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. There's a limit to what we can do, but do we have to make sure that we have a seat at the table? When it comes to our local government, our state government, and our national government, do we have to make sure that we have a voice? Do we have to make sure that we look at the political developments around us? Do we have to make sure that when anti-Semitism rears its head, we pay attention we know where it comes from. We are ready to react. Do we make sure that we are not only living lives of religious visions and of prophetic ideals and of a sense of redemption that might come into the world, but that we live in the world and that we function in the world and that we take care of ourselves and of others? We have to. We have to. But aren't people's ideas, I mean, is there some real organization there? People's ideas are so fragmented and they're often so, one is for and the other is anti and then they let the whole thing go. Is there some central I think, and that's a really interesting question. The que I'm going to repeat the question again. The question is, what happens when there's debate, discussion, and disagreement about the direction? Which is all right? I ever read about. Well, which is true, and it does happen, and we do have quite a bit of it. But with regard to anti-Semitism, with regard to Holocaust denial, with regard to what is happening in the Ukraine, I don't know of disagreement. When it comes to those issues that truly threaten us, that truly threaten our well-being, I don't know of significant disagreements. And here, we do have to be ready to act. I, I want to say, um, I do not see um, many... Um, I do not see a question or a comment that's arrived to me online. Uh, it is 12.20. I have kept you here uh, now five minutes longer, four, four and a half minutes longer than I was supposed to. We were supposed to end at, at 12.15. I wanted to share this with you because I did not feel comfortable letting us study the scroll of Esther and not reaching this point. This is so important for us to see. The text of the Scroll of Esther in this respect is transformative. It is transformative of who we are. And I have to tell you, uh, there is, in this regard, no other text like it in the whole of the Hebrew Bible. So next week, we're going to talk about the corpus of the five scrolls and how we read them together, and how we compare them, and what these scrolls really mean to us as a corpus. Um, and we're going to talk about our lives, and what we make of these scrolls in our lives. And the following week, we're going to meet in a church, and more information is going to be forthcoming. And I'm really delighted that we're going to be able to have an opportunity to engage in study and worship with
uh, with, with non-Jewish colleagues as well uh, on these kinds of subjects. Um, thank you. Thank you for joining us.